It is perhaps the most tragic of ironies that the American institution, which above all others advocated enlightened thought and behavior, can provide comprehensive introduction to the most base of human character flaws. Of all the places where bigotry, prejudice, and intolerance should be absent, the university is the most prominent. This is where a gay student living in a dormitory is justified in being concerned about sleeping through the night without being burned alive. This is where an African-American student has to hear racial slurs said not quite softly enough from somewhere behind them while waiting at the bus stop. This is where an Asian student is well advised to understand quickly the prejudice against them for skewing the grading curve. This is where some aspiring professional engineers feel that women should remain in liberal arts. I hate to be the one to tell you, but not only is this college in America, this is Virginia Tech. Before Virginia Tech was established, this land was home to the Monacan and Tutelo tribes. As the colonization of Virginia took place, Native Americans were increasingly displaced from their land and robbed of their rights. At the same time, African Americans were being captured and enslaved to provide laborers for the colonies. The entire campus of Virginia Tech used to be uh, one large plantation called Smithfield. When uh, one of the presidents passed away, it was broken up into smaller pieces for each of his sons. And that's how you get the Solitude House, the Smithfield House, the Kentland House, the Greenland House. And Robert Taylor Preston would eventually be the owner of what we know today as Solitude. The other thing that Robert Taylor Preston is going to get as part of his inerrance is enslaved individuals. And those individuals would uh, bring Robert Taylor Preston his own wealth. But the building itself is a storyline of how slavery really benefited the European community. I realized that I was really digging deep into white scholarship in terms of trying to figure out the lives and the details of these slave communities. The only time we connect cross-generational traditions, legacies, and cultures in slavery is when we talk about post-generational, cross-generational slave trauma. In addition to the documentation that we have regarding that the enslaved community used the Mary Tree, we can get more into detail about what that usage means by looking at what we still do as African-American community, as an African-American culture, and as a direct descendants of that family. But when we started filing other descendants, we started finding some things that was consistent amongst all of us. What were those traditions? What things are we still practicing? What things are still important to us? And then we can translate that back into that time because those are the things that we learned from them, especially when we think about it's really not that far back in terms of generational legacies. And so you think about religious gathering, we think about music and celebration, the art seems to be really huge. And so we like to think that those are the type of things that are going on at the Mary Tree in detail because all documentation tells us is that they gathered there. The Preston family was actually the most influential unknown family in American history. I mean, they worked next to George Washington, they were Virginia senators, they were Virginia governors, but a lot of people have never heard of them. The Preston and Olin Institute was named after William Ballard Preston of Smithfield, a well-known businessman, farmer, and politician. He was the third largest slave owner in Montgomery County. The building was a Methodist academy for boys, which later became part of the Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College in 1872. William Addison Caldwell was the first to enroll after hiking 26 miles from his farm through mountainous terrain to get to Blacksburg. His journey is reenacted by the freshman cadets every year, and a statue of him can be found climbing the stairs in front of Lane Hall. The uniforms the cadet wore were black and gray and were inspired by the Confederate soldiers of the Civil War and resembled other military institutes of the time. The AMC had a strong emphasis on military discipline through their Corps of Cadets. James Lane was the cadet leader of the time and a professor of military tactics who had served in the Civil War as a Confederate general. Lane and several other administrators believed all colleges should participate in four years mandatory military training and equated postgraduate success to the system. The school lacked a set organizational plan when it opened, which caused disputes over curriculum and ruffled ties between faculty. During a faculty meeting in 1878, President Charles Minor punched James Lane and a fight ensued. 
The fistfight got them time in court and bad publicity for the school. After seeing a drop in student enrollment, they moved forward with a strict military model and dismissed President Minor. Built in 1888, Barracks No. 1, now Lane Hall, housed 130 cadets and still bears hundreds of signatures scratched into the bricks by cadets dating back more than 100 years. Claudius Lee came to VAMC to establish the college's physics laboratory, further his own education, and later teach. He received a degree in electrical engineering in 1896. As the editor-in-chief of his senior yearbook, Lee created a club titled the KKK. He is listed as the father of terror, with the objective to right the unrighteous. Historians are unsure if this was evidence of an active clan, others just dismissed it as a joke. Lee was also part of the Pennsylvania Club, which displayed a disturbing image of the lynching of a black man. Lee's right hand of terror, O.M. Stoll, was also part of the KKK club. He is recognized for coining the term Hokies while participating in a contest to come up with a new spirit chair. These men were representatives of the school who seemed to support white supremacist values. During this same year, the school reorganized again, changing its name to Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Oop Prozum became the school's motto, Latin for that I may serve, and school colors became green and orange. Paul Beringer received an MD from the University of Virginia in 1877. During his time as chair of physiology at UVA, he wrote a paper titled The American Negro, His Past and Future. Beringer's writing claimed black people were predisposed to savagery and criminal behavior because their ancestors came from Africa. He claimed these undesired traits were hereditary and advocated for whites to legally discipline these people as slavery formally provided. The paper was printed and distributed to all medical societies in the South, and he later went on to become the sixth president of VPI from 1907 to 1913. The first women listed in the university catalog were Superintendent of the Infirmary, Frances Brockenborough, Librarian Mary G, and President Secretary Margaret Spencer. Professor Mary Moore Davis established the Home Economics Program. In 1910, Ella Agnew became the first female home demonstration agent in the nation, and the first woman to have a building on campus named after her in 1949. Prior to female students being admitted full-time at the university, they were allowed to sit in classes for no credit. In 1921, 8th President Julian Burris proposed admitting female students to all courses for credit, and the board unanimously voted in favor. Twelve women were admitted to VPI that year. It was initially assumed they'd study horticulture or economics, but of the five full-time students, Mary Brumfield, Lucy Lee Lancaster, and Carrie Sebold enrolled in applied biology, Ruth Terrett in civil engineering, and Billy Cambridge in applied chemistry. Cadets were not happy about the admittance of women. They would protest by throwing water on them, booing them during official ceremonies, and criticizing them in the yearbook. Ruth Terrett decided to prove herself equal to the male cadets by putting on a cadet uniform and climbing the water tower, an early tradition for the cadets. The men did not include them in their yearbook, The Bugle, unless they were associated with a male or co-ed club, which is when the women created their own yearbook, The Tin Horn. The women at Virginia Tech were forced to have a league of their own. Thus, the Tim Horn was born in 1930. It was just like any normal yearbook, ranked by class, club activities, achievements. But it only consisted of the women's students and a couple of professor allies, and where they wanted to have a place of their own. Hillcrest Hall was the first women's dormitory at Virginia Tech. It finished construction in 1940, making it nearly a decade before women officially had their marking and adequate sleeping grounds at the school. And it remained a safe space for all the women on campus for decades to come. 1953, the year that will forever change Virginia Tech's reputation and population. Irving Pedrew, a young black student, was offered admission into the engineering school a year before desegregation of schools was officially enacted in law. Many would say this is a victory and a glorious move on for Jane Tech's part, but others are not so sure. You know, looking at a few records of the Hodge family and kind of um, um, knowing the information of how they helped the students Virginia Tech during desegregation. They were uh, admitted to Virginia Tech, but they couldn't eat on campus, they couldn't stay on campus, and they couldn't live on campus. And so uh, families like the Hodges would, would step up, and the Hodges most famous for it, of taking on these students and these individuals to give them a safe place to eat and a safe place to stay uh, while they're really taking you know, the huge role of desegregating Virginia Tech for future generations. The Hodge family became a safe space when Virginia Tech couldn't. 
and it will forever be an important part of Virginia Tech's history. Carmen Venegas graduated with a BS in Electrical Engineering, becoming the first Latina student to graduate from the engineering program and at Virginia Tech. Linda Adams was the first woman black student to graduate in 1968. In the 1970s, Virginia Tech joined their first black faculty members, and this includes Heidi Ford, Ella Louise Bates, and Johnny Miles. Some people say that Virginia Tech was the original trendsetter of desegregation across the schools. Some people have a different view on that. Some people say, are we just a black enigma? Is that all a minority's existence is? Are we just a statistic for funding? Or are we truly valued? I'm a little skeptical about history. Not saying that I don't think that they were the first, but it's kind of like, what was their intent? Um, it's very rarely that on the subject of historical racism in general, that people do things without wanting to benefit. Over the past 50 years of Virginia Tech's history, student organizations have become increasingly vocal on campus and have fought for recognition and change. In 1978, the Black Student Alliance was founded, giving Black students a space in which to connect and share Black culture across campus. 1979 marked the first Gay Awareness Week organized by the Gay Student Alliance, a group previously banned from meeting on university grounds. This week held the first annual Denim Day, a day in which students were asked to wear denim in support of gay rights and of their fellow peers. With the need for more spaces for minority groups to meet on campus, the Black Cultural Center was created in Squire Student Center in 1991. This space would serve as a safe space for students to meet to celebrate Black culture and Black history. 1991, however, would also become a year in which hate continued to prevail on the campus of Virginia Tech. This year saw a hate crime on campus when an openly gay student storm room was set ablaze and a Ku Klux Klan march was held in downtown Blacksburg. This march was met with protests and a counter event, the celebration of unity, in which students and faculty gathered to support peace. In 1995, the Black Studies program was created at Virginia Tech, giving students from all backgrounds the opportunity to learn more about Black and African cultures. Virginia Tech would continue to teach the importance of understanding culture, race, and gender with the founding of the American Indian Studies Program and the Women's and Gender Studies Program. Just one year after the creation of the American Indian Studies Program, a Columbus Day protest was held on the drill field of the campus calling for the day to be renamed Indigenous Peoples Day. Following in the footsteps of the Black Cultural Center, in 2016, three new cultural centers were created to provide resources for the growing number of diverse groups on campus. Among these were the LGBTQ Resource Center, the Native American and Indigenous Peoples Center, and El Centro. 2017 would see the foundation of the Asian Cultural Center. 2017 would also see the first annual powwow at Virginia Tech, which honored the native heritage of Virginia Tech's land and of the students who celebrated this heritage. In 2019, Indigenous Peoples Day was officially recognized by Virginia Tech. This would be the first of many renamings and acknowledgements in honor of the diverse history of Virginia Tech and its students. I guess the biggest last project related to the Fraction Family Cabin is the renaming. And as a family, we really appreciate that work because that work that they did for those 30 years is the reason why it's still there. Um, when we came looking forward and looking for our history. 
2020 saw the renaming of Lee and Barracher Halls to Hodge and Whitehurst Hall in order to state that the university was choosing to honor the legacy of the Hodge family and African-American student James Leslie Whitehurst over honoring the racist legacies of Claudius Lee and Paul Berenger. 2022 will be the 150th anniversary of the university. According to the Diversity Report of College Factual for the year of 2021, Virginia Tech's overall diversity ranking is number 605 out of the 3,514 schools in the ranking, achieving an above average score in overall diversity, yet remaining average in many respects, including diversity averages determined by race. This report finds that of the 28,584 undergraduate students, 43% are women and 57% are men. Within those undergraduate students, 64.5% of students are white, 10.3% are Asian, 6.9% are Hispanic or Latino, 6.8% are international, 4.8% are multi-ethnic, and 4.2% are black with the remaining students classified as unknown or other. With the inclusion of more students of different cultures and backgrounds throughout its history, the college has been able to grow academically to provide its students with more diverse knowledge and experiences. However, the university still has a long way to go in providing excellence in diversity and inclusion as it moves into 2022. That what they should do in 2022 is not a pat on the back. It's a deep breath. because there's more to do, but you did something. As Virginia Tech takes this deep breath towards the plunge to a greater future, we are reminded of the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his book, Where Do We Go From Here? One of the great liabilities of history is that all too many fail to remain awake through great periods of social change. Every society has its protectors of the status quo and its fraternities of the indifferent who are notorious for sleeping through revolution. But today, our very survival depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant and to face the challenge of change. The large house in which we live demands that we transform this worldwide neighborhood into a worldwide brotherhood. Together, we must learn to live as brothers, or together we will be forced to perish as fools.